Right, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us tonight uh, for this webinar um, and um, appreciate so much interest and participation in this event. Um, we have a lot of people on tonight and that obviously is an indication that perhaps that there's a lot of interest among our Aero Club members in, in this type of event going forward during these times. Um, I'm, for those of you that don't know me, I'm David Hampson and I'm the Vice President of the Aero Club. And, um, uh, provide, co hosting to, uh, providing the ho hosting tonight on Zoom is, is Keith Leonhardt, our secretary. Thank you very much, Keith, for, for helping us out with that. Um, and then um, our presentation tonight will be given by David Colbert. Um, the, the title is Lessons Learned from a Career in Test Flight. And um, obviously, the Aero Club in New England has a lot of events in person. We've done many of them at uh, Hanscom Airfield, the Civil Air Terminal, and we've done others at at other venues, um, including the Chateau restaurant. You know, during these unprecedented times, it's obviously not something we can do at the moment, but we're look, constantly looking for ways to stay engaged with our membership, provide you with interesting educational uh, events, and um, we'll probably have some more of these in the coming months until we can once again, you know, meet in person. Um, and uh, um, I'm sure we'll find some, some very interesting topics, but this is one of, the, one of the, I think, most interesting topics we've actually had in a while. So I'm really excited about the seminar. Before we get started, I just want to um, you know, let everyone know that we're, we're muting everybody um, during, during the presentation, but you can type in questions you have um, at the bottom um, if you have any. And you know, towards, the towards, end, the end, yeah, towards the end, we will um, give every, you know, answer the questions and give everyone an opportunity to, 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 you know, to talk as well if you want to you know, speak up in person. So um, before we get started, I just want to give you a little more information on David. Uh, David Culbertson. Um, also nicknamed uh, Poppy, Pappy, I should say. Um, he joined MIT Lincoln Laboratory in November 2018, um, so right, right, in the hand, right at Hanscom, and he's the manager of the flight test facility. He's responsible for providing lead, uh, leadership and management direction to the facility's flight, maintenance, engineering, and administrative personnel to enable safe, effective flight and ground operations of the laboratory's uniquely modified aircraft that support diverse research and development programs for national security. David's career spans nearly 40 years in aerospace and flight tests. Prior to joining the laboratory, he was a chief test pilot at CalSpan Corporation, which is an international flight research company. Before working at CalSpan, he was an assistant professor and the director of flight tests at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. David began his career by serving the US Navy for 20 years as a, as a, as a fighter pilot, test pilot, and acquisition professional. He made extended deployments to the Mediterranean North Atlantic aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And he was the chief flight instructor at the US Naval Test Pilot School, a chief test pilot and director of quality at the Naval Air Depot, the Navy's principal aircraft overhaul and repair facility in North, in, in, in North Island, California. And he was also the avionics systems project officer for the FA-18 program. David has a bachelor's degree and ocean engineering, and he graduated with distinction from the U.S. Naval Academy. He also earned an engineering test pilot degree from the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School and a master's degree in aviation systems from the University of Tennessee. He has many ratings, including an airline transport uh, pilot, pilot certificate, and he has nearly 8,000 flight hours, and the most, the most impressive thing here is in more than 70 different aircraft including nearly 4,000 hours, approximately half of his time, in experimental highly modified aircraft. I'm sure some of which he's gonna tell us about tonight. He's a fellow in the Royal Aeronautical Society, associate fellow of the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. And of course, he's a member of our very own Aero Club of New England. So without further ado, I will turn it over to David and let him uh, go from there. Thank you very much, David. Unmute, yes. David, thanks. Thanks. That's a great introduction. Where'd you get all that uh, information? Uh, uh, you must have done some research because uh, uh, I don't think I provided all that uh, information. Thanks. I feel honored uh, uh, to be able to uh, uh, present as part of this uh, uh, webinar series. Uh, I appreciate uh, the, the uh, ask to come here. I, uh, my wife and I moved up to uh, this area. Uh, we have no roots to New England, uh, I, I'm sad to say, but we moved up here back in 2018 uh, when I started working for uh, uh, the uh, MIT Lincoln Lab. Uh, and uh, I would have to say that everybody uh, here in the Bedford area and New England area have uh, welcomed us uh, with open arms. Uh, uh, I first met Keith uh, as part of my official meet and greet 
when I needed to meet uh, the folks at the the, uh, the airport. And uh, I think uh, uh, after the official uh, dialogue, it was, uh, hey, we've got this uh, aero club in New England, and he talked it up really well. And so I appreciate, uh, and, and I've been uh, a member ever since. Uh, it's only been a year and a half, but uh, I've enjoyed a bunch of your, the great, uh, uh, events, uh, a few of them uh, have been really uh, engaging and I've enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, in fact, I was thinking about this uh, um, uh, about uh, last year sometime uh, when Russ Bartlett came uh, and provided, we were at the USS Constitution Museum and that was a, a great engaging evening. We were sharing, uh, you know, hors d'oeuvres and uh, nice uh, drinks. That was, uh, uh, it was, uh, that was an enjoyable evening and engaging and Russ was uh, happened to be a, a colleague of mine uh, and uh, a, a former student actually in the plate in plate training so uh, it, it's so quickly we go from that engaging evening to the environment we're in right now and I, but I do appreciate uh, uh, the Aero Club uh, uh, accommodating this kind of a, a venue it's very hard for us to, uh, to keep our professional relationships up and uh, be able to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, our passions together when we're not together. Uh, and this is a great venue uh, uh, to share our invaluable experiences. So I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm here to just talk about really the, uh, uh, my experience at MIT, a little bit of the history of MIT, just for those that don't know much about what we do. Uh, I can't go into all the details, but a little bit of that. Then, I'll, then I'm going to jump into uh, uh, the meat of the, the presentation is, is really some of my experiences uh, that uh, bring some lessons learned uh, that I think we can all uh, uh, take away. Uh, some of them are a little bit uh, 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 things that anybody would say would be a lessons learned, but I've got a story behind it. So that's, uh, that's and, and one of the things that I, when I grew up in the, uh, the Navy, we talked about uh, uh, being uh, almost like a, a, no offense, but the Alcohol Anonymous, Anonymous program, where it was really important for us to uh, fess up our mistakes and talk about it so everybody can learn from it. So some of these things that I'm going to talk about today are things that uh, happened to me, and uh, uh, I learned from it, and I'd like other people to learn from it too. Um, you gave a great introduction, uh, and so I, I'll probably skip all that, but a couple airplanes that I flew in the training command uh, uh, once I started uh, down in Pensacola was a T-34 Charlie, uh, and then uh, moved on to the T-2 uh, Buckeye, uh, and then finally got my wings uh, in the A-4 Skyhawk. Uh, that's, uh, that's how I started. Then I made uh, two deployments on the Theodore Roosevelt, and then uh, joined, became a, a test pilot, uh, going through test pilot school. Uh, that was a great experience and, and uh, opened my eyes to the whole world of aviation. Instead of just being a single seat fighter pilot, I was able to uh, uh, see the other side, see what helicopter community was like, see what the maritime community was like. We did exchange tours with uh, uh, foreign nations. I got to fly the Mirage 2000 uh, as for my graduation exercise uh, over in France. Uh, uh, I, I flew uh, P3s and other uh, aircraft, so it was really a great uh, great tour. Um, uh, after the Navy, I, I was, uh, as it was mentioned, I was at Embry-Riddle as a professor. Uh, I helped stand up a fledgling, a fledgling uh, flight uh, test center there, uh, and then moved on uh, to be a test pilot for CalSpan for 13 years. And then when this job opened up, uh, it was exciting, and I uh, uh, applied and, and got accepted, so it was great. Um, so I'm, I'm happy, happy to be here. Let me see. So oh, that was the slide I was supposed to go to. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, there we go. Now uh, let's talk about MIT a little bit. Many of you know about MIT, probably more than I do. But uh, I thought I'd give a, a quick uh, uh, rundown on the history of MIT as I go into some of the missions that we have. Uh, the, the MIT Lincoln Lab uh, owes its uh, roots to the RAD Lab, the Radiation Laboratory, uh, that started during the war. Uh, the, uh, the British uh, uh, were uh, developing some, uh, this thing called radar, and they needed some help. And they, this uh, uh, Sir uh, Henry Tizard uh, came to the United States to some of our uh, greatest uh, uh, scientists uh, on a mission. 
And uh, from that, uh, that, uh, that meeting and that committee that was developed, they developed uh, the radiation laboratory. And that went on to uh, develop uh, and design more than 100 different radars that were used during World War II. Uh, the, that radiation laboratory was located on campus, MIT campus, uh, from 1940 to, to 1945. At its height, it had 4,000 employees. It stood down after the war, as a lot of things did after the war. Uh, and, uh, and then as the, uh, the new threat changed and the Cold War threats changed, uh, the Air Force made a request and said uh, to uh, MIT again, they wanted another rad has, or, I mean, a rad lab type uh, environment and developed a, a federally funded research and development center through MIT. Uh, and it was built out at Hanscom Air Force Base uh, to handle the threat for air defense uh, technology system. Instead of just building radars, they wanted a massive uh, radar system that could connect uh, with massive computers. Um, and uh, so the, the main uh, initial task was to build the SAGE, which is uh, the semi-automatic ground uh, environment uh, system. A lot of large computers, networking, uh, large radar sites all processed together. It was probably, you know, one of the first networked uh, computers, right? Um, and in fact, uh, what I saw in the notes that uh, the SAGE system was powered by the largest computer ever built, 22,000 square feet. So um, that's the, uh, that was pretty big at that time. And it's probably had the same power as the laptop I'm using right now to, to uh, do this presentation. Um, here's a picture of the, the SAGE in action. Uh, this uh, photo shot was probably used, I think, in movies like uh, the uh, um, Dr. Strangelove and the Colossal. Uh, so it was, it was a big deal back then. Uh, and uh, in, MITRE uh, was formed out of this and uh, they acquired the system and they operated uh, the, the uh, it was kind of transferred at that point in 1958. Uh, today, what's the Lincoln Lab? Well, here's an overhead shot of the, uh, the, the, what you could call the, 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 uh, uh, the, the laboratory itself. We call it the laboratory up on the hill in Hanscom property itself. Uh, it's been, those are about three buildings on that that were built in 1951, but now uh, I don't know how many buildings you can look. That's the, the main area and it's gonna be expanded uh, in the coming years too. There's about 700 active projects, about $1.1 billion worth of funding. It's a research and development uh, center. We are not into production. We are not into uh, competing with industry. Uh, uh, we have approximately 4,000 employees. So about the same as what the RAD had, uh, uh, had at, uh, at, its, at its peak. Uh, one of the big things that we, we do is rapid prototyping from an idea to uh, um, to testing it uh, on the, in, a, in different uh, back shops and then uh, putting it in the air and testing it in flight and then developing that technology and maturing it so we can hand it off to industry. Uh, that's kind of our mission in life. Um, we still have connections with the, 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 the MIT campus uh, and uh, also connections with uh, industry and other academic institutions. Um, so that's a little bit about just the, uh, the Lincoln Lab. Now we'll talk about, uh, uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, flake test facility itself. Uh, here's uh, a few shots of uh, uh, photos of the, the hangar and the fleet over the years from the 50s uh, to the 80s to the 90s to the present day. Uh, you can see uh, early on, uh, we had uh, mostly military derivative aircraft. And then uh, we transitioned over the years to all commercial derivative aircraft. Um, uh, if you see the, if you can really see the sign there in the upper left, that says actually uh, um, the MIT Instrument Laboratory. Uh, that was actually part of MIT Draper uh, in the early days, in the 50s. And we transitioned, and that facility transitioned to MIT Lincoln Laboratory proper in the 70s. Okay? Um, but uh, you can see the different aircraft. If you look at the, the, uh, the lower right, that's our present day and our present hangar. We used to be located over uh, on the southwest side of the airfield 
uh, on Virginia Road where uh, Retrix is located now. Uh, now uh, in 2001, we moved to on the base and took over the big hangar. Uh, we have, right now we have, if you go from left to right on the, that's on the tarmac there, our tarmac, we've got two G4s, a Cessna 206, uh, an HU-25 Falcon 20 uh, uh, jet. We have a G2, uh, two twin otters and a 707. Uh, in a couple months, we're gonna add a Saab 340 to the, to the fleet also. Uh, and some folks have been watching us from afar for many years, the 707. It, uh, it's planned to be retired uh, at, the, uh, at the end of this year. So uh, it's been an icon uh, for us. And just like um, uh, every franchise uh, team, any team that has a franchise player like a Tom Brady, well, um, it, Tom Brady had to go at some point. And so I guess uh, our uh, 707 has to go, so. It's done some great service for us. It's been very venerable uh, platform, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth and uh, we need to move it on to, to other uh, platforms. Uh, a couple other things to note, uh, we've uh, got, uh, we have 12 highly experienced uh, test pilots coming from military and civilian experience, uh, very diverse. We have 17 highly experienced a and mechanics uh, and six of those uh, hold their, uh, uh, IAs, so uh, we're a certified 145 repair station for our aircraft, and uh, so we can work on our aircraft uh, and uh, even more extensively, we don't have to send things out. Uh, we have oversight authority over all of our aircraft. They're all experimental uh, 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 and registered experimental operated uh, airplanes, and they're all highly modified. Uh, we have a, we work, work closely with the FAA and DARs and the Air Force uh, in uh, um, obtaining our uh, airworthiness. Uh, we support about, at the lab, about 20 projects a year, and we fly about 800 hours in those aircraft. So that's just a, a quick uh, rundown of the fleet. And uh, I guess the way we're, we do this is we'll get all the questions at the end, so save them up and uh, uh, um, I'd be happy to uh, entertain any of them. Uh, if you look overhead, you can see where we're located. Uh, if you're not familiar, um, the, uh, we're on the Hanscom property itself in the big hangar where we used to be over uh, by Retrix over on the southwest corner. And you can see where the Lincoln lab, uh, actual lab uh, itself, the main lab is at the top of the hill. That provides us some autonomy at times from the Lincoln lab, uh, main lab, so that we can just do our business. Uh, but we have a very close relationship with, uh, with uh, the airfield. We, uh, uh, as you can see, our tarmac opens up right onto Massport. Um, and uh, we, uh, our, our tarmac, uh, there's a green line that we, uh, that it's Air Force property and then you'll go uh, beyond the green line and then you're uh, into uh, uh, Keith's, uh, Keith's property. So uh, we're, uh, it, we have a very good relationship with them. Some of our projects require uh, some uh, assistance from uh, the uh, uh, Massport and, and what we do. So um, I, I thought I'd talk about some notable projects over the years. There are many, uh, and here's just a snapshot of a few. Um, uh, like I mentioned in the 70s uh, is when we, uh, as, a la as a flight test facility, went from Dra the Draper Lab the MIT complex over to the uh, uh, Lincoln Lab, and uh, we were part of the uh, the air traffic control division within the lab. And uh, our our first projects were to support uh, the uh, development of basically uh, S mode. And uh, uh, we uh, developed the S mode, and and we were the first to fly and, uh, and develop that. But before that, if you go back to the laboratory itself, uh, I mean, I the Draper Laboratory. Charles Draper was a pretty aggressive uh, 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 technology uh, developer. And uh, uh, in, uh, I think it was 1953 with uh, a B-29, he took a team of uh, engineers and actually a, uh, uh, Eric Severide, the uh, famous uh, TV journalist, and he flew uh, across the country from, uh, from uh, um, Bedford, Hanscom, all the way to LA uh, uh, with an, an autopilot that he had developed and they was using 
this inertial nav is one of the very first inertial navigation systems that I understand that I know to fly in an airplane and that controlled the navigation of the airplane all the way there uh, and back and that was the development that later uh, an inertial navigation system that went to the moon so that's uh, that's our roots uh, and uh, in the 70s uh, we took on the challenge of uh, uh, the, the mode S and a lot of flights and developing that. And then that was handed off uh, as we all are flying with mode S today. And that was the beginnings of uh, the routes to establish TCAS and ADSB. Uh, and those, uh, all those uh, programs were uh, developed uh, at MIT Lincoln Lab myself, uh, it also, as I understand it. Uh, then we started uh, developing uh, and being involved in some DOD and DARPA programs uh, beyond the uh, uh, FAA programs. And some of these pictures you can see, uh, uh, one of the first programs in 1974, uh, a DARPA program was the Hostile Weapons Location System. Uh, it was an optical system used for battlefield to, to see, uh, uh, to find shell trajectories. And so we flew that around. Uh, I don't know what happened with that technology, uh, but you can see that that's in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, um, uh, on that airplane. Then we got into some IR imaging with tactical lasers uh, and developing, uh, uh, which later those lasers, which I'll talk about, became great for civilian use. Uh, then in 1978, uh, we were involved in the cruise missile defense uh, technology program, all these part of Cold War developments, uh, and then later became the uh, air vehicle survival evaluation program in 1983. Uh, the program focused on uh, understanding and modeling survivability of U.S. aircraft against existing threats. Um, and that's still an active program today. Um, uh, we we, we uh, uh, started uh, initially flying with some towed decoys uh, that would uh, uh, be, uh, uh, um, that would come out of the, the, the back of the airplane. And we were modeling those uh, for, uh, uh, and those things are flying right now in tactical airplanes. So that was back in the 80s. We went on and did some infrared uh, radar development uh, uh, and the, the infra, uh, infrared uh, airborne radars uh, uh, started to make tactical images. And this is where uh, later on we use those technologies for humani humanitarian purposes, where we took uh, some of this technology to like Puerto Rico or uh, Houston, uh, uh, for the har after the Harvey um, uh, hurricanes, uh, and we were able to map fairly accurately the the from the destruction the debris fields, and that, that they could figure out where they needed to send the trucks to clean up, saving millions of dollars for the FEMA folks. Uh, another program which is kind of in the center uh, came in 1990, which was the Airborne Seeker uh, Testbed Program. Uh, and uh, it was used to collect uh, uh, um, data and simulate missiles. Uh, so uh, you can see all those different sensors on the airplane, and those were to evaluate the vulnerability of U.S. forces to a missile attack. Uh, so that, that, that's, uh, um, and all this information, if you want to go exploring, you can find it on our website. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm summarizing what you can find on our website. Uh, then we got in the uh, 90s, we got into TCAS development. Um, we would fly these, this new uh, technology and fly airplanes right at each other and hoping that it would give you a pull up, pull up. Or, um, and uh, thank goodness it's well deployed now and, and saving people's lives. So I actually have had a couple, um, sorry about that, a couple incidences in my life uh, and where I had to respond to a resolution alert in a TCAS system. And uh, uh, I was saved because uh, I followed the TCAS and the other airplane followed their TCAS and uh, uh, we didn't have an airborne collision. So um, I thank MIT Lincoln Lab for the development of that. Um, let's see, what are some other things? If you can see on the, the, uh, the venerable uh, 707, uh, the workhorse of uh, MIT Lincoln Lab for many years, uh, one of the programs was called Paul Revere. Uh, it was basically a battle uh, communication system. Uh, it tests a lot of different communications, but it has been used for many other programs over the years. 
Um, uh, right now, it's it's part of a program called Fab T. So, uh, and uh, before after that goes away, the airplane goes away. Um, if you look in the upper uh, uh, on top, you see the Capitol building. This didn't involve directly with the flight test facility, but we helped in the testing of it. That's the enhanced the regional situational awareness program that was developed after 9/11, uh, 2003, to uh, pre uh, uh, kind of prevent a layer around the uh, the, the uh, Washington D.C. area from intruders. Uh, it, it would uh, there's some uh, lasers in there and uh, uh, some radar tracking, and we helped develop that system. And then we, as a lab, and then we uh, tested it by going and flying airplanes against it. Um, and where we were able to actually fly in that area where you're not allowed to fly, we were flying there on a routine basis so we could test the system. This is all still before I got here, right? But those are a few of the programs. Uh, we were very involved in the airborne laser uh, uh, program, you know, that big, uh, uh, I believe it was a 707 that had that gigantic laser on the front, a tactical laser that could, uh, I think it was really developed to shoot down, uh, shoot down things, a high energy laser. Uh, we were involved in that as a target. So it, it could shoot, it, it could fire the laser at our airplane uh, and we could uh, uh, see how strong that laser beam was. Um, so as you can see, we've done a lot of things. This is just a, a quick, small paintbrush uh, of uh, the, the projects that we've done at the flight test facility to support national security. Um, uh, you can look us up on the web and you can see in more detail of any of these programs. Uh, and in case you didn't catch it, I'm pretty honored to be here uh, and proud to work with uh, a lot of dedicated uh, uh, professionals. Uh, one of the things that my dad said when I was very uh, young, uh, he said, uh, uh, Dave, you're not the smartest tool in the shed. Uh, so for you to succeed, hang around with those things, people that are smarter than you. So I, I heeded his advice, and so I'm hanging around a lot of people who are smarter than me. So. Um, wanted to show you a few places where we fly. So sometimes uh, uh, we'll fly uh, overhead, uh, Hanscom, and do patterns because of the, the equipment we're testing is right there uh, located, and we need to uh, check out locally. Uh, you've probably heard our call sign if you've flown in the area. If you hear research, research uh, 404 Papa Alpha or uh, 3 Alpha Romeo or something like that, that's us. Uh, so uh, uh, we have a very close relationship with the local ATC uh, to be able to do the things we do, especially sitting underneath a class B airspace. Um, uh, there's many times we need to be actually flying in that class air, B airspace or flying on top or around and AT, local ATC helps us uh, greatly. Uh, some other places, we go down to the Cape a lot because it's a, an area where we can uh, operate and we can bring targets down there um, and offshore. We also fly all the way around uh, New England and West Mass. Uh, we have a low level route we use for training because some of our mission profiles, we need to be flying low levels. Uh, and so we train uh, occasionally uh, uh, when the weather's correct. Uh, and good. We'll train up and up, going up into uh, uh, Maine uh, on that low-level route. Uh, we do a lot of low-level routes when we go out to the go out to uh, California, or et cetera, out in the ranges where there's nobody out there. But we need to practice uh, before we get out there. And we also use special airspace around the uh, Massachusetts area, and sometimes we'll even go down into the uh, uh, Virginia Vacapes area uh, for flying. Most of this is the jet work that we do. That small Cessna, we don't go out there with the small Cessna. And then elsewhere, uh, we, we, we support military uh, and FAA uh, testing, uh, DARPA Homeland Security testing, uh, all across uh, the uh, United States. Uh, we've gone to Alaska, uh, and uh, we're uh, hoping to go to Hawaii uh, sometime soon for an exercise also. Uh, you can see we deployed to Puerto Rico. Uh, for uh, uh, after a hurricane to find out what the debris field would be uh, so, and testing the technology. So that uh, takes me uh, introduction to MIT um, and the flight test facility. 
Uh, now I'll start working, talking about the lessons learned from my career in aviation. I probably have more lessons learned and some things that I, I'm probably too ashamed to talk about, uh, or uh, there's somebody else's story and they're not mine. Uh, so I don't feel comfortable sharing it. But these are my stories and I've kind of put a title to them as I go through them. Uh, first one, uh, it's better to be good than lucky. Um, and if you prepare and practice, you'll make your own luck. Uh, uh, there's no I in teamwork. We've heard that many times, uh, but there are many individuals and lots of work to do. Attention to detail, the smallest things matter. I learned that uh, very early on as a test pilot. Uh, I'll talk about the power of the no vote. I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, if you heard of, heard of it in your life, but I'll talk about how that applies to our flight test world and, and maybe you can apply it to, to your, uh, your flying also. And the last is, uh, is uh, 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 something I made up, but something I learned that uh, in the flight test world, sometimes uh, analysis is good, but uh, test is best. Uh, so it's, 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 you can analyze something for a long time, but it's better to uh, get in the air and just see how it works. Um, so I've got some nice uh, pictures and, and some discussion items as I go through this. So, so it's better to be lucky, uh, uh, good than lucky, okay? We've also, we've heard that expression, it's better to be lucky than good before, right? Uh, I think that was coined uh, by Napoleon, actually. Uh, I was reading on Wikipedia. Chuck Yeager used it. Uh, so did uh, 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 F-35, uh, uh, P-35, uh, a World War II fighter pilot by Lamar Gillette or Gillet. Uh, apparently Lefty Gomez uh, from the New York uh, Yankees used it. And it was also attributed into a movie, Broadway musical called Pippin. So it's better to be lucky than good. But all those folks that said that were actually good. So they made their own luck. Um, so uh, I learned from a very early on age. I mentioned that I, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the group. And I'm also not the most talented, but uh, I learned that through grit, perseverance, and determination uh, that I could uh, persevere. And uh, that's how I, I looked at it when I became selected to become a, 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 a pilot from the graduate, after graduating from the Naval Academy. I, uh, one of the things going through uh, T-34s, which is, you can see the T-34s in the upper right, uh, that's down in Pensacola. I joined there in 1983. The program consists, it's about five months, you go through uh, uh, basic familiarization, uh, instrument flying, simulators, uh, 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 you'll do some uh, uh, formation flying. Uh, it's, it's an aerobatics. It's a, it's a pretty early on intensive course, uh, about 70 flight hours. Um, uh, but the thing that I learned going there is I needed to, um, uh, I made my own cockpit out of uh, cardboard and put it in the spare bedroom. And I practiced every single flight before I flew it. I practiced all the procedures, all the buttons that I had to push. I simulated in my hand what I had to do, about how much. And uh, I closed my eyes and I kind of imagined the flight. I guess they call that armchair uh, flying. So I learned how to do that. And I probably flew every flight more than once uh, while I went through the program. Uh, that helped me uh, as I got into the T2s, which you can see in the on the left side of my uh, screen, uh, and then also A4s, which is on the, the right side. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we did in the advanced training with air-to-air uh, uh, -air gunnery and uh, for advanced formation flying, you know, maneuvering formation flying and low-level flying and air-to-air -air combat. But uh, uh, probably the most intense uh, and challenging and rewarding experience is landing on the aircraft carrier. Uh, the Navy thinks that so much that 25% uh, of the, the, the syllabus is dedicated to that one event, landing on an aircraft carrier. Uh, when I first started aviation, uh, when I was uh, uh, starting the, the jet pipeline, I went through uh, in a big auditorium and the commanding officer of the, uh, 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 the test squad or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the squadron there uh, said, uh, uh, look to your left and look to your right and he says, one of you aren't going to make it. Um, and, and at first I thought one of us was going to die. That's what he meant. But actually, uh, uh, he, went, he meant that we weren't going to make it. 30% of the people that go through the Navy pipeline when I was going through uh, washed out. And they washed out mostly at the end. 
because they couldn't land the airplane on the aircraft carrier. Uh, you could be the, the best formation pilot or the best bomb dropper, but if you couldn't land on the aircraft carrier, you were sent home. So uh, that, that's, uh, that was an experience. But we practiced and we practiced and we practiced. The last 10 flights of the syllabus was nothing but landing on the aircraft or practicing landing on the aircraft carrier. And your very last flight was to go out to the aircraft carrier all alone and, uh, and land and uh, get six landings on the aircraft carrier uh, uh, in the T2. And then in the A4, it was, uh, uh, it was another six landings. So it was quite the experience. Um, and uh, I, I'd say that uh, uh, practice makes perfect uh, and, and the dedication uh, is required. So in that case, I wasn't lucky. Uh, maybe I was, but I, it was because I was, I was good. I knew my airplane and I knew my mission and I practiced. Uh, a similar philosophy goes into the flight test world. Um, uh, when I took that into the flight test world, when I became a test pilot, uh, after making it through test pilot school, where I did the same thing. I made cockpits of my airplanes and practiced my, uh, the flights before flying, uh, uh, going through the test pilot school. I also carried that same uh, um, uh, practice into when I was a test pilot, uh, except now I had simulators. I could practice my events, uh, test events and rehearse them. Uh, I could do a test card review. Uh, but what I found is that there's a lot of people involved in this uh, program. We evaluate the electrical and structural of, uh, issues with a flight test, the aerodynamic effects, and then we go uh, do an event finally. Uh, I think there's probably 100 hours spent in preparation for a one hour of flight test. Um, I, you could, don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere around that ballpark. Uh, and so I, one of the events that happened to me uh, was uh, a new mess, missile development program for the F-18. Uh, I was required to uh, fly a very precise profile uh, over the, uh, out in the Atlantic, uh, about 100 miles out in the Atlantic, because this live missile needed uh, a, a, a small enough footprint to not hit any uh, um, ships or boats or airplanes or submarines. And so we had to go out there and uh, I had a chase airplane, I had range control, there was a P3 that was clearing the range. Uh, a lot of assets for this one shot. Uh, the, uh, but the, what was peculiar about it is it was an endpoint test where I had to be at uh, six Gs at 90 degrees angle of bank. And because of the footprint of where the missile would go, I had to uh, be within plus or minus 100 feet of the delivery. And from the time they cleared the range, I had to deliver that weapon within five minutes because that's all I had for that range to be cleared to be able to launch. Um, of course, I practiced that. We did address rehearsals in the simulators and that came out uh, fine. And so again, the practice uh, makes perfect, I think, in that regard. Uh, I think what Jack Benny said, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Well, how do you become a test pilot? Uh, you practice, okay? So uh, that, that's my lessons learned in the, it's better to be good than, uh, than lucky. Uh, another uh, lesson uh, would be, uh, there's no I in teamwork. Um, I think we've heard that expression before uh, by motivational speakers, or there's no I in team, I guess. Uh, I think it was first coined by a, a Pittsburgh Pirates uh, baseball pitcher, according to Wikipedia, at least. Um, after earning my wings of gold and being a T2 uh, instructor uh, for a little while, uh, about 18 months, I uh, became one of the initial cadre of F-18s, uh, uh, operational F-18 pilots in the, in the mid 80s. Um, so one of the uh, first cruises was in the North Atlantic uh, for me. Uh, and this is, this is an example of teamwork where um, I was uh, uh, on a, uh, uh, I was uh, sitting as a five minute alert pilot while we we're in the middle of the North Atlantic. And we got a call that uh, one of these uh, 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 bare uh, Soviet bombers, that they were Soviets back then, was coming right at the aircraft carrier. I don't know how many miles, a couple hundred miles out. Uh, they got wind of it through whatever intel and then it became on the radar. And I got launched off to go intercept it. 
uh, I was alone and, and, and afraid. Um, uh, uh, but the thing that uh, I point out is the team, there was a team behind me, uh, the ordnance men that loaded uh, the airplane with the heat seeking and radar guided missiles, the, uh, uh, the plane captain that made sure the airplane was ready to go, all the people on the flight deck that were launching me to get me airborne on time because it's a, you're kind of graded on a five minute alert. You better be airborne in five minutes from the time they say go. Um, and, uh, uh, and then there's the E2 AWACS and the, uh, the uh, radar control uh, operators on the ship. And then there's a tanker out there to make sure that I don't run out of fuel when I'm trying to chase this bear. Uh, so I got launched off and they all guided me to the intercept and I was able to meet the bear uh, before it uh, got inside any threat uh, rings. And then uh, other aircraft, uh, the, uh, the Tomcats joined up on me and uh, we all were able to escort the bear away from the strike uh, group. Uh, and uh, that, was the, that was the mission. And uh, uh, it was not uh, because I was, uh, you know, here I was a 29 year old single seat fighter pilot, but it was actually, it was the team that, uh, that did that that day. So uh, that, that's a, kind of an initial experience where I learned that, uh, in fact, there was a point there I felt like the whole Navy was supporting me and they were on my shoulders. I didn't have to carry the burden. Um, another uh, uh, teamwork uh, point that I'd, uh, uh, lesson learned from teamwork. Uh, I, when, I, when I was a test pilot at Pax River, I was involved uh, in many different things besides that, uh, that one missile delivery that I gave you. I was also the endpoint uh, test pilot for this program called uh, uh, canted vertical ejection racks. So the F-18, when it first came out, the F-18As, uh, uh, you were able to put one bomb on each pylon uh, for delivery. So these big bombs, uh, gravity, uh, general purpose bombs, uh, one per each pylon. So that means two on each wing and one on the center line. That means you were restricted to five bombs you could, you could deliver. But at, with that, you had a pretty good envelope that you could operate in. Almost the entire envelope of the F-18, you could carry and, and deliver those, um, those weapons. But if you wanted to drop more bombs, you had to put these, what they call vertical ejection racks on, and they limited the envelope of the airplane of where you could, of what you could deliver the weapons. Um, and uh, so they could carry two weapons or two bombs per rack uh, or per, per pylon. So you could go from five bombs to 10 bombs. Um, and uh, when they developed this program, I was the uh, test pilot to, uh, and the, the, the program objective was to expand the envelope of these, uh, uh, these cannon vertical ejection racks so that you could have the same envelope as if you just had one bomb in each pylon. Um, the, the program was, uh, 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 you, I have it depicted there flying in the, uh, the, uh, the area of the Pax River area, Patuxent River area down in Maryland, uh, where the restricted area is. But you'd climb out out of Patuxent River, do a 0.95 mock climb, intercept this, kind of intercept the lines that I've, well, I've given you, and then roll in heading south uh, east on where that blue line is, uh, a precise heading, uh, uh, to a 60 degree dive in full afterburner and intercept your, uh, your, your mock delivery uh, airspeed. So, uh, and then release it when you reach your calibrated airspeed. Uh, pretty involved maneuver, but uh, there was telemetry, there was a range controller. Uh, I had high speed uh, photograph uh, uh, on, the, on the wings. Uh, to, and, and in different areas to uh, record all this data. Uh, and uh, I had to be, it was almost like as I'm uh, being um, driven around those uh, that uh, depicted uh, flight path, I was being controlled like it was a, uh, a PAR, uh, a precision approach. Uh, uh, and I had to be plus or minus one degree in the delivery. Uh, I had to be uh, plus or minus 0.1 G's in the delivery, so 60 degree dive, 0.5 G's, and the airspeed I had to be plus or minus 0.01 Mach, so I can't tell you the Mach that I was delivering. I don't think I can, 
but let's say it's greater than 1.2 Mach. Uh, and the airspeed, I'll just say it's greater than 600 knots. Um, and uh, uh, I won't, uh, I don't know what it is, what the rules are on that, it's been a long time, uh, what, what you can say and what you can't say on that, but I, I can say that. And you'd, you'd intercept that mock line, come down in full afterburner, burner, release the afterburner, and then get ready to pickle. The airspeed and the altitude in your, your HUD, your HUD's up display are just going like this, and somehow you gotta figure out when to deliver that weapon. Thank goodness the, the controller, they're, they're, they're monitoring all the same stuff you are, and they're giving you a standby, standby release. And they'd give me these little nudge headings if I was off heading. You'd get a practice run, and then you'd have to do it in real life. Uh, this was uh, more them controlling me than me actually doing anything. Uh, so uh, that's just a symbol, another symbol of, uh, or uh, an example of the teamwork in flight test. Um, uh, it was pretty amazing to do that, but uh, uh, you, you actually almost can close your eyes and follow the, follow the path that they give you. Another thought uh, uh, I said is attention to detail and the smallest uh, things matter. Um, uh, those were uh, those other stories I gave you were success stories. Uh, now I'm going to give you a, a success story, but maybe that could have been uh, a disaster. Um, and I'm willing to talk about it. And I don't think uh, it's not written down anywhere. So hopefully no one's recording uh, this and they're sharing it on YouTube. Okay. Um, so many of you are familiar with uh, risk management tools that evaluate the likelihood and consequence of an event occurring. We use this all the time in flight test world to, to help mitigate our risks, uh, develop hazard analysis and develop uh, risk plans. Um, but most of the time we really look at the high visibility risks uh, and not necessarily every single thing. There's a lot going on in a flight test program and you better capture the high visibility risks. Um, but from my experience, maybe you need to look at everything. Um, so this example that I have, uh, I was involved uh, in the, uh, uh, the enhanced performance engine development program for the F-18. Uh, early on, the uh, F-18A through early C models had a very great engine called the GE-404, uh, but the Dash 400 series. It produced about 16,000 pounds of afterburning thrust per engine. Uh, the airplane could be uh, greater than one to one on takeoff if you if you lightly loaded it in a, in a very combat related role, but not a heavily you know in like an air to air role. So it was a very uh, good engine. But as the airplane was uh, getting bigger in the later C and D models, uh, uh, it was carrying more not bigger in size, but but heavier with its weapon systems and outer mold line changes and more weapons that it could carry that were bigger and heavier. Uh, it, uh, we, 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 there was an upgrade to the engine to accommodate these increased weight to have increased thrust. And so the EPE engine, advanced, uh, enhanced performance engine was a very critical program. It also was at the same time when the Finns and the Swiss were buying an airplane and they chose the F-18 over the F-16 and over, uh, I think the Raphael because um, of the F-18 and the promise to put the EP engine in their airplanes. Um, so uh, it was a very high visibility program. Uh, and I was fortunate to be involved in the later, the latter part of it with the carrier suitability uh, testing. Uh, after about a year of flight test of doing uh, engine runs and, and, and stand, engine stand runs and uh, uh, air start, uh, uh, different air starts and all kinds of envelope testing, we, uh, uh, we went to the carrier suit. This, this picture you show here is uh, uh, me going down the catapult uh, at Lexington Park, I mean, not Lexington Park, but um, Pax River outside of Lexington Park, Maryland. They have a, a, a Navy catapult that can launch uh, aircraft. It's exactly a Navy catapult. It's on an, uh, an adjoining or a parallel runway. Uh, uh, and uh, so it simulates everything that you would simulate except uh, airflow over the, the, um, over the deck. Uh, these decks, these uh, uh, tests were to check to make sure the steam, uh, excessive steam ingestion 
would not uh, uh, snuff out an engine. After we did that, uh, we were going to take we take the airplane up to Lakehurst, New Jersey, where they have these uh, cat uh, uh, resting gear at the at the middle of the runway. So you could uh, do these what they call roll ins, where you'd uh, get up to maybe a low speed or a high speed and roll into actually Navy arresting gear, not Air Force, but Navy arresting gear, and to check out the integrity of the airplane. Uh, uh, to get qualified in that, uh, about a month before, a buddy, uh, a colleague, and I flew up in an A7 on this low level route, which I have depicted there up to Lakehurst, New Jersey. I was told that uh, there's two ways to get up to Lakehurst, New Jersey. You could fly an IFR route uh, going around uh, Philadelphia and dumping into Lakehurst, New Jersey, take you about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and uh, you go through a lot of congested airspace, or you just take off and fly a low level at 420 knots and get there in 40 minutes and don't talk to anybody. So w I was introduced to this, uh, this low level route is how to get up to Lakehurst, New Jersey. So when it was my time to take the, uh, the F-18 up to do these roll-in tests at, uh, uh, into the arresting gear at uh, Lakehurst, New Jersey, uh, it was a beautiful day and I chose to do the low level route. Uh, it was what I knew and uh, it was a beautiful day. Why not enjoy the uh, Eastern shore and, uh, and get there quicker. Actually, I kind of said, oh, I don't want to get violated by, as a single seat pilot going into the class, by the class B airspace of Philadelphia. Um, so on this low level route, okay, oh, did, I think I mentioned this was an international uh, uh, attention uh, profile. And there was only three EP engines at that point developed, one for the engine stands and two for the airplane. And they weren't going to build any more engines until the success of this program. So we're at the end of the program. I'm taking the airplane up there on a low level route. And some of you that might know, uh, might uh, start getting a tingly feel. I think Tom Washington's out there who's an A-10 pilot and he's probably getting an idea what I'm gonna tell him. Um, so somewhere over Maryland, before I got into Delaware on this low level route, I see this big uh, black uh, uh, quick object flash in front of me. Uh, it was a turkey buzzard that was uh, uh, that started to dive. I pulled up quickly uh, to avoid, which with the intention to avoid uh, this, uh, this big bird. Uh, and uh, it went down uh, below the airplane, uh, about where the engine is. It went kind of down the fuselage. Uh, I did not hear any noises, any thumps, which I've heard before. I've, I've had burst strikes before and I didn't hear that characteristic thump. Uh, the engines looked good. I just slowed it down and I finally got up to Lakers, kind of with my uh, head between my tails and hoping that I didn't ruin the engine. Uh, uh, the one and only engine at that point that, could, that it could do the test. I showed up there, there were no remains of any birds. They dove the, the ducts of the, uh, of the intakes. Uh, all the uh, engines looked really good. And so we proceeded to do this test. Um, but I, I throw this out as small things matter. We had a test plan. We had looked at every single risk, including um, uh, resting gear failures, compressor stalls, um, FOD, all these things. Uh, but we didn't account for the ferry flight up to, um, up to, it was just a reposition flight. Why would you put that into the test plan? So uh, something to think about. And so I say, was I lucky? or good, I hope to say that I was both. Um, how are we doing on time, Dave? Um, we're still good. I would say maybe another, you know, if we finish up with another 15 minutes or so, so okay. there's some time for some questions, yeah. that'd, that'd yeah. be good. Yeah. Good, good. So I'll quickly go through uh, what uh, the power of the no boat. Um, uh, I throw this slide up here because, uh, um, you know, when you have a team, Everybody matters in a team, but sometimes you have to come to a, a, a consensus and you have to come to a, a decision to move forward. And this is a classic picture of where different um, disciplines, if they were designed an airplane, this is what it would look like. So I throw that out there as uh, uh, there is compromise, but there is also, you have to hold uh, strong to your, uh, your, um, uh, your ideals uh, and safety, safety matters. Uh, so here's a quick example of the power of a no-boat. Um, 
uh, I was involved with a, uh, a, a, a test program when I was the chief test pilot of CalSpan. It was a, uh, an aerial refueling program. Uh, uh, we were designed to be a surrogate UAV test bed for the X-45, uh, which was an autonomous UAV. They had to prove that they could land on an aircraft carrier all by themselves with nobody on it uh, and also do air refueling. We were the development platform for all the software uh, and development. And we were going to do a, a probe, uh, a, a, a probe to drogue basket refueling uh, in the Learjet as part of the buildup for the X-45. Um, so I, I throw that program out there. Um, uh, when I was a young uh, Navy Lieutenant uh, learning to be a test pilot, uh, one of the big tenets at the Naval Air Test Center was the no vote. Anybody that is empowered to be on the team should have the ability to say no. So before every design review, the finish of every design review, before the, uh, an airplane flies or the next phase of a program, anybody could stand up and say no. And that would be analyzed and we'd come to resolution and it was non-punitive. Um, so uh, here's an example of a no vote that program that happened. We were involved in heavy um, negotiations with the, the Navy. Uh, at first, this program was going to be completely run under civilian aircraft operations. Uh, uh, CalSpan is a research company, not unlike MIT Lincoln Labs. And we were gonna fly uh, in our experimental rating and do these uh, air refueling. The, the, air, the FAA had approved it, uh, but the, at, the, at the, the end of the program, the Navy came in right before we were ready to go do this, uh, uh, these plugs. Uh, the Navy said, uh, uh, no, you're gonna have to delay the program. We need to give you a military airworthiness uh, authority to go fly a flight release. So in these negotiations with the Navy, it got pretty tiring, a lot of long days, and we finally got the test plan approved by the Navy and the flight clearance to go fly, and we were ready to go. The ink was still wet on the test plan, and we were coming in the next day to go fly. Uh, I thought we were ready. As the chief test pilot, I was shouldering the burden for success uh, of this, and I um, uh, admittedly, I was a little bit blindsided uh, by the health uh, of, the, uh, the, 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 of, the, of the crew. Uh, my uh, my co-pilot, who was a very experienced co-pilot, came in the next morning and said, uh, hey boss, I'm not ready to go. Everybody was looking at us, Northrop Grumman uh, and uh, the Navy and a couple other programs. This was high vis at the time. And I'm like, at first I said, what? What do you mean we're not going? And then we sat down and we talked about it. And uh, um, we came, I said, you know, you're right. Uh, uh, we're not ready. And uh, we had to go to the Navy and uh, to our own company and say, uh, we're not ready, we need another day. And uh, the power of the no vote, uh, the next day we, we got sleep, we briefed it, we rehearsed it, we practiced. Remember practicing? We had not practiced this. And I didn't get to armchair this thing and I was ready to go. So um, I'm glad that uh, my co-pilot, uh, trusty co-pilot pointed it out and we practiced and we had a, a pretty good flight. Uh, so a successful flight. Um, so uh, in which I'll give you a video of it in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but I also wanted to add into that, analyze is good, but test is best. Um, we did a lot of analysis for this program. And as I mentioned, the, 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 Air, the Navy said, uh, uh, we don't think you can do this. We don't think your trusty Learjet is capable of doing that. Uh, uh, I guess they didn't know that the Learjet was based on a design of a Swiss fighter, the P, uh, uh, P, uh, uh, I forget, P, -thir I forget the name of the program, but maybe P-35, I, I forget the name, P-16, I think. And it, so it's design, it's wing, it's aircraft was a pretty uh, robust structure. It was one of the early airplanes designed with a slide rule and not a CAD. So we knew it had a lot of margin. And so we went and tested things, uh, but we did not end up changing the design. Uh, uh, after six months of delay of the program, uh, the program was near the end of the program. They had run out of money, but they said, okay, let's finish this and do uh, a couple flights to prove that you can uh, actually do this. 
And so we went up and actually tested it. But the thing that I thought was pretty interesting, all this analysis and oversight, we didn't change anything. It was the, it was the same test plan. It was the same, uh, um, uh, same data, same design. But uh, the six month delay in the program uh, prevented the Navy from getting uh, extra data that they needed for the X-45 to do their error refueling. That error refueling project, uh, uh, they were hoping to jump into that uh, about six months after we did our stuff, but they had to delay two years because of the program. So that's interesting. That's why I kind of say sometimes it's just good to get into the air and go fly. Um, and so for your enjoyment, I thought I'd show you uh, the first plug of a business jet with a Navy refueling probe to uh, behind a basket. Uh, so let me see if this goes through, but I'm going to have to take, uh, well, I think I'm going to leave the volume off. Let's see if it goes through, uh, if, the, if the video goes through. So here we are flying behind the Omega tanker with a, uh, uh, a basket, just like you have for the Navy. They, they do a lot of uh, work for the Navy. And we're just practicing really station keeping and getting ready and comfortable. Uh, we had uh, uh, gone around uh, and found where the wake turbulence was so that we were comfortable where we could exit in case there were any problems. And uh, because this is a little bit longer, I will move this along. Uh, is it working, Dave? Okay, okay. I'm gonna move this along to where we actually do the plug. Um, so you can see that basket's moving a little bit, huh? Uh, that's the way it is. These were a calm day. So now we're all set up. We kind of cinched down our, uh, our um, um, uh, uh, belts, our seat belts, uh, and uh, we had goggles on. So in case something happened to the windscreen, uh, that we would be, our eyes would be protected. Uh, and here we are coming in for the uh, final, uh, uh, we were in pre-contact and now we're going into uh, contact as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, the jargon is for the tanker community. So I'm, I'm coming in at about uh, two, knot, two knots per uh, second, I think, is what uh, we, we had to do. So nothing really exciting, but as, as we point out, the, 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 the Learjet is not equipped, wasn't designed to do that. So it took a lot of uh, work uh, and analysis initially on our point, uh, but uh, a lot of practice to get to the point where we were able to do that fairly easily. Um, now I'll show you one, one view from the, uh, from the tanker, for tanker perspective. And then, uh, we'll, and then I've got one more thing to talk about. So here we are, this is the tanker. They've got a window out there to see us coming in. Um, it's really, really slow closure, I guess, is what you would say, but that's what it was designed. That was the test point we had to meet was a two knots per uh, second uh, closure rate. Okay, all right. So that's a summary of uh, some of my lessons learned that of things that actually were, that I experienced. Um, practice, teamwork, attention to detail. Make sure your team is empowered to uh, for, so someone can say no if there is something that doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, smell right or feel right. And uh, at some point, you got to get in the air and you got to test something. So, uh, um, uh, you know, what is, the, what is that expression that uh, uh, Voltaire said? Uh, uh, Perfect is the enemy of good enough. So um, I'll leave you with that. Uh, the last thing I I'd like to share with you um, and then we'll go up to questions, is uh, recently, uh, the, the, uh, we've all experienced this COVID and it's still around. And, and, and in fact, when I made these charts, I put in what the United States profile looked, if you see in the upper left, and this was on June 9th, I think, and what Massachusetts profile looked like. Uh, those are not what they look like today. They've changed in a week. Um, but uh, the COVID environment was upon us pretty quickly. Uh, everybody was making uh, decisions on what to do, how to run businesses, how to, uh, the governor was having to make big decisions. 
on how to run Massachusetts, our laboratory, the DOD. And on, on March 17th, we decided to stand down. We just started to take a pause from our flight operations uh, because of the COVID uh, 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 risk of uh, bringing COVID in. And we knew that if COVID uh, came into our flight test facility, then we were done for a while. Um, we, we took that time to uh, evaluate uh, what the rest of the world was doing. We did NBA prof, uh, webinars, FAA webinars. Uh, uh, we, I, we contact and reached out to a lot of BizJet flight departments, uh, flight test departments, NASA, uh, the Air Force, the Navy, to see what they were doing. And they, it was all over the map, as you probably imagine. There were people from, we're not doing anything, to we're not flying and we don't plan to fly until it's gone. So um, wearing masks or not wearing masks. So we, uh, we, we continued to evaluate that and look up what the best practices were. And we came up with an SOP for how to get us back to flying. It took us about five weeks of discernment. Uh, we had employees that either had family members that had immune uh, uh, compromise uh, issues or they were taking, they were, they had compromised immune deficiency or, you know, people that worked in our lab, not necessarily pilots, uh, but we also had, uh, um, uh, we had folks that were taking care of little ones. They were in homeschooling now and, and uh, they didn't know how they could get back to the lab because they had to take care of their family. So uh, we cautiously stepped through a procedures involving how we would disinfect the airplane how we would uh, treat flying, uh, how we would operate inside our building, uh, controlling access into the building, uh, um, and then also um, uh, the, the, the peak, uh, uh, the, the pace that we would use. And also, uh, we, uh, we were, because we are part of MIT, we were able to be the guinea pigs for MIT's COVID testing surveillance program. I volunteered us for it, and so we are tested every two weeks. Uh, all the uh, folks that are in the lab that work at the flight test facility, that touch airplanes or touch our systems that are going to be on the airplane or fly them, maintain them, or that have close contact with those that do. And in May 1st, we brought ourselves back up to a flight posture. Um, and uh, May 6th, we flew our first uh, um, twin otter to evaluate all our procedures and to get proficiency and uh, we've been taking data again uh, for supporting the test programs for research and development for our nation security now for uh, since uh, the middle of May uh, and by the middle by June or the end of uh, by end of July I mean we're going to be back up to speed uh, but we're taking uh, all the cautions that we have to to take all the steps, uh, you know, it was a crawl, walk, uh, maybe jog uh, profile. So, um, and uh, so the last thing I wanted to show you before questions is I just, this is just some PR for MIT uh, Lincoln Lab. And I'm gonna take it off of my headphones because there's some music with this, okay? So uh, stand in. Can you hear it? Okay, I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you very much, David. That was that was very interesting, and really appreciate you putting that together for us. And I'm sure that everyone, all of membership, um, it, it found it very interesting as well. Um, and I particularly will say that I I really liked um, your your point on the power of the no vote in aviation because I think there's been some you know high profile aviation accidents that have occurred in, even in the airlines where there's been a lower ranked you know co-pilot 
um, who's the first officer who's been afraid to speak up and, and say no or, or, or say what they should do because of, because of their rank. And that's something we have to remember that, you know, everyone needs to, needs to be aware of, you know, when something's not right or um, there's a risk involved, not to be afraid to speak up. Um, so, so thank you for all, all of your tips are excellent uh, in terms of lessons learned. So I think now we'd like to open it up for some questions and, um, you know, uh, Keith's going to be moderating this and um, there's obviously a large group. So um, Keith, what do you think is the best way to do this with regards to the questions? So I think if uh, people want to, to try it where they can just unmute themselves and ask a question and just be, uh, be cognizant of jumping on each other and we'll try to get through this um, democratically, I think it'll work fine. So if anyone has a question, why don't you go ahead and unmute and then see who speaks first. I do not know what the, the airplane in the front of the 1987 photo, I'd have to go uh, get, uh, uh, get that, look back at that, uh, that presentation. So, um, so while, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna look, what you're talking about. How about that? 1987. David, are you Sorry. able to hear anyone else? I'm not I able to hear anybody if somebody's talking. Okay. I don't, hear, I don't hear anyone either. So yeah, no, I don't, no one ever wants to be the first one. So please speak up. I'm sure people have some good questions. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll answer that one text. Uh, that one chat question, 1987, the airplane in the front. I think that was an MIT uh, developed program uh, that uh, that was a, a human powered uh, flight airplane. Oh, oh, right. Yeah, I don't know the name of it, but uh, that was. Yeah. I hear doors closing. Anybody asking any questions? Let me, uh, maybe someone uh, wants to, uh, is anybody else chatting? No? Hey, hey, hey uh, Greg, I, I can see your boat. What, what kind of questions do you have, huh? I, I have a question, David. Okay. Um, when I was a student at MIT in around 71, maybe it was the summer of 71, I worked at Draper Labs doing oh, yeah. the, uh, some work on and um, it was using ultraviolet along the horizon of space for navigation for high altitude things. Um, I see Draper Lab is still at the field, but you talked about it merging with or I'm not can tell us about MIT Lincoln Lab versus Draper Lab, and are you together or separate or no. what? Well, that's a good, that's a very good question. And I may not be the expert on it because some of that is um, um, what I read and what I've been told, but I haven't, uh, I don't have a lot of firsthand. The MIT Instrument Laboratory uh, was really part of the Draper legacy, uh, but uh, it, and at some point, what, uh, Draper and MIT Lincoln Lab were kind of together at some point, I guess, and then they and then they split, I believe. Uh, uh, but the the flight test facility in in that time frame, and somebody's going to know more than I am. What I understand is it it migrated all to the MIT Lincoln Lab. So to and so we don't have any connections directly with Draper anymore. That's what I understand. unless somebody else knows uh, more about that. So what I understand is that the uh, the Daedalus, is that the name of the, uh, uh, that uh, MIT uh, human yeah, powered I airplane? I think that's what it was. I'm uh, the one who asked the question. Oh, okay. I was looking at that saying, I, I think I know what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think the, the, the one engineer that was really responsible for that, isn't that uh, the guy uh, uh, who's the, the president of, um, uh, Aurora, um, down in uh, Manassas. Uh, so I forget his name, but uh, uh, I believe he was uh, involved with that uh, early on, huh. I, think, I think. But don't quote me on that. Yes, the an somebody just said yes. Okay, good. <laughs> in the text. 
Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Penny. David, well, I have a question. I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned a couple of government agencies you do work for um, at Lincoln Labs. Are, are there are there others as well? Um, do you have, is, is there a wide variety of different federal agencies that call upon upon Lincoln Labs for for, for help? Yeah, I, I think just about every government agency could uh, could tap us if they needed to um, uh, through the through the contract. But uh, we regularly do stuff, obviously, for all the DoD because that's where I, we're. Uh, we're a FFRDC under the Department of Defense. Uh, uh, and then uh, we've done things for, with NOAA, uh, the Coast Guard, uh, done things for Homeland Security, um, uh, DARPA, you know, uh, I'm sure there's more. So, uh, but that's, that's what I understand. Just about any government agency we can do work for in the development. We're not, again, a, a production house. And if technology is such that that can be developed by, um, uh, for the most part, if it can be developed by industry, we don't do it. We're more in the early stages of development and we push it so that we can hand it off to industry. Uh, we we want to take the hardest problems uh, and come up with solutions. So. Question, uh, what platform will you migrate to after the 707? by Nick. Uh, good question. Good question. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, uh, uh, and uh, we're hoping uh, to uh, uh, go to a, a larger business class uh, instead of a small um, wide body. So uh, something like a G4 maybe um, uh, is one of the thoughts. So. I, uh, I had a quick question um, in the picture you showed of the, the Hanscom hangar. Yeah, um, you, you talked about all the planes on the ramp, but there, I think there was a fairly long wing <laughs> B-57 stuck, stuck there in the hangar. Can you talk to it? I've seen it. I, I don't know anything about what you guys are doing with it. Yeah, that's a WB-57, NASA's uh, airplane. So that's another government agency, I forgot to say, yeah, NASA. Uh, we uh, don't have in our fleet something that can go really high, okay? Uh, you know, a, uh, 707 or a 777 or a, or a, a Gulfstream type platform can get into the 40s. But if you want to get into the 60s to do some research and development uh, for certain technologies, you're going to have to get something like that. And uh, so that technology is, was being uh, worked on uh, and developed uh, uh, using that platform. I have a question. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have some uh, activity, uh, what you do with the SpaceX? We are not doing anything directly with SpaceX at the flight test facility. I don't know what Lincoln Lab is doing. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Say, David. Um, we've got some of our youth scholarship winners who are uh, paying for their own flight training and moving up. In fact, one of our scholarship winners just is starting with the Air Force Academy tomorrow morning. Um, do, um, do test pilots all come from the military like they used to in the old days? Or is there a path for uh, pilots who don't, don't go through the military route to eventually become test pilots if they're really good? Yeah, there is. Uh, so there is the, let's say the easy way, not the e it's not easy, but the, 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 the easy path is to go through the military because uh, if you're selected to get there and you can get through there, it's paid for, right? Um, and the test pilot school training. But, but the one good thing about the United States, uh, we honor the person who uh, works really hard and wants to uh, 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 learn himself or, or find ways to, 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 uh, to get there innovation. Uh, and so the actually, if you go to Wichita and you go to the civilian companies there, um, there is not even 50% of the test pilots for Textron and, you know, uh, all the different companies that are sitting in Wichita. What's that? Textron and, and used to, and Bombardier and used to be Cessna and Beechcraft and all that. But uh, I think Textron gobbled them all up. But the, um, um, they grow their own uh, test pilots. 
So they get an engineer uh, with a strong engineering background that happens to have a commercial pilot's license uh, and they start working with them if they want to. Uh, and if they show the aptitude and the eagerness, uh, they will uh, train them from uh, being a co-pilot uh, to being a, a, a first, uh, uh, you know, a, a first officer, not a first officer, but a, a captain uh, test pilot for, uh, for a company like uh, Textron. So uh, there is ways to get there. And there are also, there's civilian test pilot schools, but they're expensive. It's about a million dollars that a company, if they want to send somebody through the uh, National Test Pilot School out in Mojave Desert, uh, that they train people just like the Navy and the Air Force do as test pilots, very similar program, um, that, um, uh, that's about a million dollars. So uh, of a Boeing or, or, a, or a, a, a Gulfstream, hired somebody and they felt that would be the finishing touches as they'd send them there. That's what it would cost. But they also have what they call short courses. So they can send them through a two week or a six week course to get the basics too. So I think I've over, maybe, has that answered your question though? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I was just hoping to give encouragement to, yeah. to yeah. our younger audience yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. What's the, there was a tech, there was a uh, chat here. What was the worst situation you experienced as a test pilot and what did you do to recover? Mm. I'd have to think about that. I'd have to think about that. The worst situation I've had flying um, was, um, it, I was, I was testing, uh, but it wasn't a, it was a production type test flight. Uh, uh, an airplane that was coming out of heavy maintenance uh, and uh, overhaul about a, me about a year uh, down for modifications and repairs. It was a carrier airplane that had seen its day, but they needed to get it back into the fleet. And uh, I took off. Uh, I was uh, the, the test pilot that was testing these airplanes coming out of the overall repair. And I, uh, I uh, took off. It was in San Diego. Uh, and as soon as I, uh, about 15 minutes into the flight, uh, uh, there's a, uh, the airplane starts talking to you. Uh, there's a bitch and Betty. I don't know if that's politically correct anymore, I, but that's what it was called back then. The, uh, the uh, uh, oral tone would uh, come and it was a female's voice uh, that would say, uh, said in a very nasty voice, engine left, engine left, you know? And so I went and looked at it and I, the engine was overheating. Uh, and the, uh, my, uh, the, the uh, uh, nozzles in the back were, rotate, were oscillating and you could hear this surging of the motor. So I shut it down uh, and then I said, well, I better come back. It's a single engine. I'll prepare for a single engine landing. Not a big deal. I can do it. Uh, just pull out the checklist, go through it. And then as I'm coming back, I'm probably about 50 miles from shore. And now the other engine's doing the same thing. Uh, it's overheating. And uh, um, it's, uh, it's cycling through, it's really loud, it's rough. And I thought I was gonna lose that engine and have to eject. Uh, I just left the engine up and uh, at power and was it gonna, gonna accept the, um, if I lost it or it overheated, I was just gonna accept it. Uh, and then I'd have to eject, but I was heading home and I, was gonna, I wasn't gonna shut an engine down and become a glider. I was gonna stay with the airplane as long as I could. And I brought it in and, uh, uh, and landed. Uh, at, uh, at, uh, um, and so they found some problems with those two engines. Um, and I landed back at, uh, in, in San Diego at, uh, the Navy base there. So, yeah. I hope that answers your question, Michael. David, is, is Lincoln Labs doing much in the way of, um, testing with, um, UAVs or drones, um, at this point? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the lab itself is doing a lot of work with the small UASs, um, uh, but we're involved as a flight test facility because of processing. Uh, they're, the engineers are making their own UASs, they're modifying, they've got payloads on them, they're doing all kinds of things that they don't even tell us about, but, uh, but they're very involved in, in uh, testing different sensors that go on uh, those UASs, um, uh, and we're just involved with, uh, to make sure that they're 
following some discipline in their flight test uh, program. Somebody's typing. Any other questions? We have maybe just five more minutes and okay. we'll wrap things up. So if you have sure. a question, you sure. please let us, let us know. Okay, well, if no one has any other questions, I guess we can we can wrap things up. But I, once again, David, uh, extend my extreme appreciation. Thanks for, for the time putting, I know it takes a while to put a presentation like that together and for being here tonight. Um, I really enjoyed it. And on behalf of everyone at the Aero Club, um, our, our, our sincere thanks. I thank you very much uh, for, and being honored to hear. And I'm, I look forward to uh, uh, being on the other side and listening to, a, listening to one uh, next. Uh, 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 Jeff Ward asked a question. Uh, I'll quickly answer that. Uh, uh, is CalSpan another FFRDC? Uh, no, it is a private uh, company. It, its roots are with academia. CalSpan stands for um, Cornell Aer Aeronautical Laboratory, but it was once uh, a university uh, um, uh, research program that became a private company in the 70s. Uh, so. And um, yeah, definitely stay tuned. Um, we'll have, we'll plan another event like this in the near future. And um, and then and then David, you can become you can become a, a listener instead of a speaker, and you can relax. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, and uh, just to, just to let everyone know too, in terms of other events, we do have a flyout scheduled for July 18th. Um, and right now, we initially scheduled it to to Augusta, uh, uh, Maine, but it looks like with some of the restrictions in Maine, we may need to switch locations to Laconia. But stay posted for that. Um, let me know if, uh, if you're interested in attending. Um, but um, otherwise, happy flying to everyone and have, have a nice summer. And um, we will see you soon. Dave, uh, and Keith. Thank you. Good, good, night, good night, everyone. Okay. Good night.